Hi, everybody. First, uh, I'd like to welcome you all to APS. You, Aurora Public Schools is a fantastic district, so welcome aboard. Uh, my name is Dusty Burton. I am an ed tech coach for the South community, so mostly the Rainview feeder schools. Um, today, I'm going to give you a quick overview of Google Classroom and wanted to just also make you aware that the week of August 10th, I'm offering other more in-depth classrooms with regard to Google Classroom and uh, also Flipgrid. And my colleagues are offering the other classrooms uh, in terms of Cami, Screencastify, Pear Deck, Slides, Docs, Forms. So if you are uh, a little, a little um, behind in terms of the technology, I would highly encourage you to go into Performance Matters and check some of those courses out. So a quick, quick 15 minute overview of Google Classroom. The first thing you want to do is go to classroom.google.com. Once you're there, your, your screen's probably going to be fairly uh, empty at this time. Maybe your principal's already given you a class, maybe not. This little plus sign up here is how you create a class. You go ahead and hit that plus sign, create your class, give it a name, section, subject, room number if you want that you don't have to. Typically you give it a name and then the subject. So Mr. Burton's history class. Okay. I'm going to just go into my test class here. Um, before I do that, there's something else that you want to do from this page and that's these three little lines. It will give you a calendar. It can give you the to, to review button, which is a, a big time saver. Uh, in terms of grading. So I'll, I'll show you that in a little bit. But at the very bottom, you have the settings button. The settings button is going to give you quite a bit of options with regard to email notifications. I have mine turned off right now because I have a bunch of classrooms and I don't want to be uh, getting emails all the time. But as you see, you can make different choices in terms of when you get an email uh, on comments, classes you are enrolled in, classes you teach, so on and so forth. So make your choice there in that settings portion. So back to classes, you hit the plus sign, create a class, pause here, and please go ahead and make a class. So now that you've made your class, um, you're going to go into your class and it should be pretty clean template. The first thing that you're going to see um, that you want to do is create a meet link <clears throat> in the settings ratchet. That's where you're going to find some of the information for that. So I'm going to click on that. And when you've clicked on that, it's going to give you an opportunity to change your class name if you want, uh, subject area, whatnot. You can get your class code. You can choose to display it, copy it, reset, disable, all that good stuff. This is really important, the stream one. You want to always make sure that students can post and comment. Otherwise, when you get to the question portion, it won't allow students to reply to one another. So make sure that's always on. However, um, the stream is another one. I would recommend hiding notifications because students get a little bit lost when they're looking for their schoolwork in the stream. Instead, we're going to use the classwork tab and you're going to point your students to that. So I'd recommend hiding notifications. Um, you also want to make sure your guardian summaries are on. This will allow you to do a um, parent uh, progress report for your students, which I can show you in just a minute. And then, of course, you have your meet link. Uh, you can copy that and paste it wherever you want, and you want to make sure that it's also visible to students. The next piece is the grading. Um, you don't want something to necessarily be the same in terms of how it's weighted, so you want weighted by category. In this case, I've got this set up to grade, if I've marked a grade category, an assignment summative, it's going to count towards 70% of their grade, whereas if it's a formative uh, assessment, I've got it counting towards 30. This is totally up to you in terms of how you set up your Google Classroom. Uh, and you can add as many categories as you'd like. So um, that kind of gives you an idea of, of, of that. You could also name them different things too. You could say like essays or uh, labs, uh, whatever, whatever you want to do to set up your weighted by category in, in Classroom. So you go ahead and hit save. And then 
you once you've enabled the meet link, that meet link is going to show up here. The class code. If you push that little button, class code gets big, and you can uh, copy that a little easier. This is more like in person when students are first joining the class. So that's the stream tab. Let's go to the classwork tab. Okay, so now once we're on the classwork tab, um, there's a couple of things that you want to keep in mind. First, let me just give you a quick overview. Here, this is a test class. So I have a, a bunch of different topics that kind of fit different categories of, of teachers or administrators. So for remote learning, I did a lot of performance tasks as examples, daily virtual connections as materials, um, things teachers need to turn in. This is like an admin thing. Um, and then of course you have math, like a math class, or you can do topics by formative assessment, uh, or you could do topics by the quarter. Um, and you keep them organized that way. Whatever organization you have with a Google Classroom, um, I would highly recommend you know just picking something and going with it because you're going to kind of keep with that the, the whole year. And then students know and expect where to find certain things. So pick your organization technique and kind of stick with it. Um, so when you, cr when you first want to push something out to that Google Classroom, you're going to hit this Create button. And when you do, you are going to give be given the option of assignment, Cami assignment, which is one of the um, extensions that we purchased full, uh, full for premium for all staff and APS. Quiz assignment, question material, reuse post, and topic. So the first one is assignment. I'm going to just kind of show you one that I've already made here. Um, let's just look at here. So when you click on that, it's already there. You're going to go view assignment. And you're going to see that um, I've attached something for the students. So when I click on it, one of those students here, it's going to open up a new window. And this is my grading window for Google assignments. And that's it. For Google questions, yes, that's uh, graded. However, it does not pop open a new window. Okay, so let me just kind of go over assignments real quick. When you are in this uh, interface, you can access any of the students in that class. And how you do that is you, this little drop down arrow will show you all the students in your class. This is just a test class, I only have a couple students to test. Um, but it will show you if they've got, if you've got a grade, if they, uh, or it will show that it's late or just missing. So that's kind of neat. And then it also gives you the arrow to, so you can switch pretty quick just to the next one to grade the next one. So as you see, it's kind of like a mini Google document. A lot of the things you can do in a Google Doc, you can do here. Um, first of which is uh, when, when you're on here, if you're using Google Rubrics, and if you take my course uh, the week of the 10th, I'll go over Rubrics more and how to set that up. But if you do use Google Rubrics, you're able to quickly grade assignments and it will automatically update that score for the student. So as I click here, that number changes. Click again, number changes again. Um, so you can set up the rubric grade, pretty quick, efficient grading. This is a pretty long rubric that I uh, did as an example for a teacher at the high school level. Um, your rubric could be four criteria or whatever it is that you and your building are using. So then the next tab is pretty important. It's called the comment bank. When you're in the comment bank, um, it will be blank the first time because you haven't put anything in there. A little quick trick. When you click on add to bank, every time you push the return button or enter, it will add those as separate comments. So you see those two got added as separate comments. How to use that? So I've done this example a couple times, as you can see. You can highlight where you want to write a comment, and then there's this little plus sign here, add comment. Okay, so that's gonna populate a little window here. What you're gonna do is once you have your comment being filled up, you're going to click those three little dots, copy to clipboard, come over here, right click on your mouse, and you're gonna paste. There, I have a comment that's specific to a certain part of that student's writing that I that they will receive feedback on that specific part. So 
this is a kind of a game changer in terms of the ease of access to grade students work um, and really reducing the amount of time. The idea being that the less time that you are um, having to grade, you'll be able to, the kids will get more practice when it comes time to write. So the, that cycle of writing and then returning and the feedback, the teacher student feedback loop gets shortened. So therefore more practice gets done. Um, then of course, once you're done, you can just hit return to the student and then they will receive the grade. So coming back here, I'm going to go ahead and have you pause here and do your own assignment. So go ahead and pause and create an assignment. Now that you've created the assignment, we're going to go to um, a quiz assignment. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. When you do quiz assignment, it automatically comes up with a Google Forms blank quiz. You can do locked mode on, on Chromebooks. Um, the interface for creating an assignment and a question um, and quizzes and materials, all of that stuff, will look similar to this, so hence why I'm not going to go over it each time. Um, you give a title, instructions, you can add attachments from Google Drive, a link to a website, file from your computer, or you can embed a YouTube video. If you don't have anything ready to go for that, you can always just create it. It does create it right in, uh, in the classroom folder in your drive. So you can create a, a doc, slide sheet, drawing, or form. Okay, It's really important that this stays on if you want this to be automatically graded for you in Google uh, Classroom. So make sure that that grade importing button is turned on. The next thing over here, you can assign to multiple classes that one assignment question or quiz material. Um, you can differentiate by choosing which students this goes to. Uh, you select a grade category if you're using weighted grades. And then of course the due date, and then you can also assign the topic that it's gonna go under. If you do get to that rubric portion, um, that isn't highlighted until you give it a title and then this will highlight and you can create a rubric, reuse a rubric, or import from sheets. Again, in my in my Google Classroom course, it's um, I spend some time showing you how to create the rubric. So you go ahead and if you want to assign it at that time, you go ahead and hit assign. If not, you can click that down arrow and schedule. Okay. So at this time, go ahead and pause and create and play around with a quiz assignment, please. Now that you've created the quiz assignment, we go to question. Um, much like quiz and assignments, uh, it has kind of a similar interface, add, create. Um, you can choose here, short answer, or you can just do a multiple choice question, uh, which is kind of nice. It's really important if you want to use the question function in Google Classroom as a discussion thread, that this here is clicked. Students can reply to each other. Now, one of the things that happens is when students reply, uh, if you have that clicked, they will not be able to reply until they themselves have given their own response. Um, one thing to keep in mind too, it, it's just kind of uh, one of those little hacks. Students often make mistakes and instead of having to go in and turn this on and off a million times for your kids, I just like to have students can edit their answer because in their field, um, they can actually, they can accidentally hit enter and it turns it in and they can't go back and edit. So this just kind of saves you some headaches by clicking that button. It is not default though. This is default. Um, similarly, you can schedule that, save as a draft or, or uh, immediately push it out. So at this time, go ahead and play around with creating a question. Now that you've created the question, we're going to go to material. Again, interface is pretty, pretty similar, except the grading functions are now gone. A material is just something that you're going to be using for class purposes um, as a resource. I would recommend if you can add those materials to the question or the assignment itself. So if you if let's say you have an assignment about the Gettysburg Address, okay, and they have a PDF that they need to read, I would add that to the actual assignment rather than making it 
separate material. It just makes it more organized for the student. When they go click on an assignment, they have everything they need on that assignment right here, rather than having to go find a different material. Material function is, is more for things that are you know not connected to an assignment, maybe just a resource. Maybe it's just like, here's a field trip permission slip to print out at home and send back in, something like that. So material is pretty straightforward. Um, and then topic, of course. These, if you create a topic, let's say we'll just hit test topic. What that does is it just gives you a place to put these assignments to organize. So in this case, I'm gonna go ahead, left click, drag, the one that I was just playing with down under this topic, and now it's organized. Okay, your assignments are organized to the topic. Um, one more thing I want to show you is has to do with reusing a post. Now, if this is your first time ever using a Google Classroom, it doesn't really matter a whole lot because you don't have anything to reuse. However, um, if you get to that point, when you click reuse post, it will allow you to choose what class. Let me go start there. Choose what class you want to reuse this from and take an assignment, a question, or whatnot, um, and reuse that in a new class. So it's a really useful function, especially like if you make a mistake on something, you can reuse that um, and just make the changes that you need. Um, the, the, the next thing I would like to show you, um, actually before I forget, I'm gonna come back here to this main class page. And once you have a Google Classroom here, there's three little dots. When you click on that, it will allow you to copy an entire Google Classroom. So once you've got your Google Classroom down to where you want it after your first year of teaching, I know a lot of you will be swimming, copy that classroom for the next year. It's a really nice, neat, easy to use function. And go back to here. All right, so the next phase of this is the People tab. When you look here, you can have multiple teachers um, uh, per Google Classroom. And to add those teachers, you can just simply click this little person plus sign and invite teachers. Since you are in the domain, as you start typing someone, here's my colleague Greg, I can just simply auto uh, click him after I, a few letters of typing. I click invite, and he'll get an invitation to join as a teacher. The next part um, that's really, really useful is has to deal with uh, progress reports. There, I, I go a little bit more in depth in my class with this, but essentially, if I click on this student here, it's gonna land me on a page that gives an overview of their assignments. It's not super intuitive, but if you come up here to this little email button, you can email student and parent. Now, I have mine as a personal. I never took the, it says invited. That means I never accepted it. But if parents accept it, it will say to student and parents and click that button, send it, and they will get a, a progress report for their, their child. So really easy, easy to use. Um, you wanna make sure that those parents get added to those students and a way to do that, let me show you real quick. So when you're here, um, these three little dots next to the name, you can invite guardians. And that's where you go and find the student's parent's email, put it in there and send them the invitation. So it's really helpful when it comes time to, um, for progress report time. Um, one thing that I forgot to show you is anytime you click on a graded assignment, okay, I'm going to go here, I'm going to go to view assignment, and it lands me on where I can put a grade in for that student. This, this is true for quizzes, questions, and assignments. There's that settings tab, or settings button again. You're going to click on that. This will allow you to download grades to Google Sheets or CSV is essentially Excel. I like to go copy all grades to Google Sheets. It takes a minute because you're talking about a classroom full of 30 plus who knows however many assignments you have. Um, so it does take a minute. Here we go. 
The nice thing here, and again, this is a test class, so I haven't done actual real grading, but you can see where I have tested it. It does give a class average of that score and each individual score. Now, if you make any changes on this sheet to a grade, it does not reflect it back to Google Classroom, but this does give you a, a good snapshot of where the kids stand. In native to Google Classroom, there is the Grades tab that does something similar. It is a little bit slow. Mine's fast because I only have three students, but when you get up words of 30 or plus, um, it does take a little bit to populate. You can add the grades directly here and it will save that for you. So this is a quick way to just um, fill in grades for students as you're going along. Okay. That is the basic, basic rundown of Google Classroom. Again, these classes will be, uh, this, this class in particular will be offered the week of August 10th. So please look for that in, in Performance Matters. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to your EdTech coach um, and have a great day. Thanks a lot. Hello, welcome. I'm gonna be talking about Pear Deck today. Uh, my name is Kyle Montblanc, and I'm an ed tech coach for Rural Public Schools, and I serve the Northeast community. Um, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about Pear Deck. I'm not going to go too deep into um, everything that Pear Deck can do, but kind of give you a, a broad overview. Um, if you do want to learn more, please feel free to sign up to, for one of our uh, sessions. Um, we do them every week, so you can learn more about Pear Deck. So, what is Pear Deck? Um, Pear Deck is a Google Slides add-on. Um, if you're new to the district and you've never used Google Slides before, Google Slides is very similar to PowerPoint. Um, it's just Google's version of it. And Pear Deck is something that just goes along with the Google Slides. So if you go into add-ons, you might either see Pear Deck already there, or maybe you just have to get add-ons and Pear Deck will be there. Um, so once you actually are in a Google Slide and you open up the Pear Deck application, um, it'll open up the sidebar right here. Um, and this is how we make slides interactive. And that's what Pear Deck is. It is a way to make your Google slide presentations more interactive, right? So rather than it simply being something where students are either on a projector or you know at home going through a slideshow, um, it makes it so that students are required to be engaged with the content. Um, they're required to answer questions that are on the slide. Um, and I'll show you what I mean by that. So um, I'm not gonna go over how to build a Pear Deck. Again, it's just a Google slide with some pieces added. Um, if you are interested in that, feel free to join one of our sessions. I'm gonna show you more kind of what Pear Deck does, what it can do, um, and kind of get you excited for using the tool. It's, it's a really powerful tool. So first thing I'm gonna show you is the teacher view. So as a teacher, this is what you'd be viewing. Um, we all have, everyone in the district has access to Pear Deck Premium. We have a district-wide license, so you have access to all the features. Um, and so this is what is called the dashboard. So this is how you actually view your presentation as it's going on. Um, the first thing that you do when you start a new presentation is you'll actually give students a join code. So students on their own device, so whether that be a Chromebook, iPad, their cell phone, their mom's computer, whatever, um, will go to this website, joinpd.com, and type in this join code, kind of like you join a Kahoot. Um, once they've joined, they are not part of this presentation. And uh, I'll kind of show you what I mean by that. So this tab right here is going to be my teacher view. This other one, this is what a student would be seeing on their screen. So as you can see, it's the same slide as they can see, but there are no controls for this, right? They can't move through the slideshow on their own. And there's a little immersive reader down the bottom to read for them, but it's especially helpful for our English language learners. But essentially what it's doing is having the student on the presentation on their own device. This is the teacher view. Um, so what I mean by Pear Deck makes lessons interactive is that you can go through this slideshow so I'm on this slide, and on the student end, they are actually able to interact with the question. So in this example, it's asking, uh, you know, what do you think this Rube Goldberg machine is designed to do? 
if you take a look at it, it's kind of designed to open up the shed. So as a student, I'm engaging with the content that's happening in the presentation, typing it into the sidebar. Now on the teacher end, I can actually see right here, open the shed. All right, so I can see students' responses as we go through. I can also see who has not responded. So 12 people in this session never responded to this. Um, so again, Pear Deck makes it so that these lessons are interactive. You are making sure that every student is getting a chance to share their understanding and their knowledge. Now, Pear Deck works really well in both online classrooms and in uh, the you know, brick and mortar traditional classrooms. And it works well if you have students in both, right? So um, an example of how it might look inside of a, a traditional classroom, um, this is what it looked like in my classroom, was I would have students on their devices, I'd be presenting the Paradex slides up on the projector and students would have a chance to answer questions on their own devices. Now, what I would do is I would open up this dashboard, this is called the Paradex Dash, and you can open it on a separate device than you know what you're projecting from. So what I would do is I would open it up on a uh, an iPad, and I'd be able to walk around the room and see how students are answering questions. Maybe uh, you know a student is on the wrong track, and I can go over and I can instantly say, "Oh, ooh, you know, you maybe think about it this way." Um, that way, you know, I don't have to. I'm not seeing it after the fact. I'm not seeing it when students turn in their work, um, and I'm not seeing it when you know only one student is raising their hand. This way, every student is getting a chance to respond. Um, Pear Deck also allows you to display student responses. So if I really like these three responses, I click show responses, and this is what's gonna be projected up on the front wall. Again, um, we can cover how to actually you know, set up that projector at a different time, um, but this is one of the uh, biggest benefits of having Pear Deck, is being able to grab student work and display student work to you know, collaborate with uh, other learners within the classroom. So that's an example of a text-based slide. Um, some other examples of slide types, this one. So for me, this um, slide just says, read this article about six of some machines. But if I go back to that student view, I have the, uh, the slide on the left, but I also have this article that I have linked on the right-hand side. So it saves a lot of time on transitions rather than, you know, all right, every student go to this website and you have, you know, 10 that are falling behind and need help logging in and you lose, you know, 10 minutes. Now students are just automatically on this website, which is just a really, really beneficial piece. Um, you have multiple choice questions. Let's see what other types do we have? Uh, draggable slides. So in this case, Students have an icon that they have to drag around to indicate what they understand. There are drawable slides. So a drawable slide for a student will look like this. Right, they're able to draw, add text, you know, anything like that. Number slides just require a student to enter a number. And then uh, website slides. So you can integrate websites into your Paradox sessions. So this, in this case, it's Desmos. So in the you know, traditional classroom, Pear Deck works really well in this like synchronous style where students are in the classroom, they have their device, the teacher's going through the lesson, the students are answering. However, Pear Deck also allows you to work asynchronously. So in that synchronous version, you can give that code to a student that's at home. And as long as they're you know, watching a Google Meet of the session you know, in, at the same time, they'll be able to engage the same way. An asynchronous session, you know, where things are happening at a time that is most convenient for the student rather than, you know, in a one-on-one -on -one situation. Um, an asynchronous situation for Pear Deck, Pear Deck allows for that is kind of what I'm trying to get at here. Um, and they call it student paced mode. So I'll show you what that means. So if I'm in this session and say, I got to this point in the, in the lesson and I go, okay, you know what? Now it's time, uh, the rest of the slides are gonna be uh, work on your own or homework or you know, what, what have you. I want you to be able to go and do that. What you can do is go over, click these little buttons, turn on student paste mode, 
And now if I go back to this student version of the slide, I'll move my image around a little bit. I'm actually able to control what slide I'm on. And in this case, I'm a student, right? So I still have the opportunity to respond to questions. But in this situation, I'm able to go through it at my own pace. Oh, what's this one? This is a Flipgrid, yeah. So this integrates with Flipgrid. You can embed YouTube videos that you want your students to watch. Um, so the asynchronous piece is super powerful when it comes to um, remote learning, simply because, you know, some of our learners are not going to be able to um, access the content at home at the time that is best for us. Maybe they have a younger sibling they're taking care of or, you know, what have you. And maybe they, you know, they have time at nine o'clock at night where they're able to go through the presentation. This asynchronous student paste mode allows them to still go through the content, but at a time that's more convenient for them. All right, that is going to be my brief, brief overview of Pear Deck. There's so much more to this tool, so many different ways to um, ensure student engagement and give student access to content both at home and in the classroom. So if you are interested in learning more, please feel free to go into Performance Matters, uh, find one of our PD courses and uh, join that. We will be having them uh, every week for the foreseeable future. All right. Hey everybody, I'm gonna to talk to you today about Flipgrid. Flipgrid is a really great online discourse tool for students. It's something that APS and APS we've adopted as kind of our go-to outside of G Suite um, uh, platforms. Flipgrid allows for video responses of students and for them to respond to other students. Um, so the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna to go to flipgrid.com and there is the educator sign up. Go ahead and do that. The first time you do it, it's going to ask for your Roar K-12 email and credentials. I'm going to just go ahead and go to Educator Login. So go ahead and pause and go to Educator Sign Up. Now that you've signed up for Flipgrid, you will see that you land on this page here called My Grids. Flipgrid is doing a pretty major update. Um, by August 5th, I believe, some of this will, the interface of Flipgrid might look a little different, including this grids are going to be start to be called groups. So instead of 17 grids after August 5th, it will say 17 groups. There'll be some other different functions of Flipgrid after that as well. Um, so I apologize, I'm going to be giving you kind of a late uh, uh, version of Flipgrid. So the first thing you want to think about is a, a grid. A grid is, think of it as like a classroom. So what would you name your Google Classroom? Uh, second period social studies, okay? So that's what you'd want to name your grid, is that classroom. Now you can combine and just do um, all social studies together or all whatever, depending on what level you're teaching. Um, for elementary classrooms and you have a class and we're all going to be in these cohort looks models it looks like so you could just do it for that um, that one topic or that one um, content area so let's go ahead and add a new grid you can give it a name and the next part's really important you want to click this school email that way anybody that's outside of the Aurora K-12 domain won't be able to access it okay at the very bottom it gives uh, a flip code you can put in a new one if you want. If you don't like it, it just auto populates what you have here. Go to next. Notice that it is it captures the aurorak12.org domain, and that will create the grid for you. You go ahead and hit next, and you've created your grid. Go ahead and let's just go here. Go ahead and click on that new grid. Um, it should give you a brand new. Uh, intro topic, you can keep that, or if you'd like to just get rid of it, um, you can uh, just delete or edit it, sorry, actions, and delete topic. So this is your class name, right, your grid. Um, think of now a topic is an assignment uh, that you want to push out to students. 
So let's go ahead and add a new topic. When you get to this page, we're going to go ahead and just give it a quick name. Um, the prompt is really important. This is going to give the students instructions of what they are supposed to be talking about in the video. So, for example, um, you know, please answer the question above. And I think this is really important. Respond to two of your classmates. This piece here, responding to two of your classmates, is really important to um, make sure that students are actually watching other students' videos. So I, I would kind of just make that as your go-to at the end of any prompt, make sure that they respond. It does default to minute and 30 seconds. You can do anywhere from 15 seconds to 10 minutes. Um, I think that minute and 30 is probably a good amount of time. Remember, whatever you assign is what you're watching. So uh, this 10 minute mark or even five minute mark, I would really reserve those times for more summative assessments that you might be using Flipgrid for. Otherwise, uh, if you're doing formative, anywhere from 15 to a minute and 30 should be plenty of time for them to, to listen. Because you, of course, want other students to watch videos too. Uh, the moderation, this is good really if um, students have don't have like a permission slip to record online. So I would definitely get something in writing from parents saying that they're allowed to do it. Turning that on is pretty good. New videos will be hidden from students until you activate them. So if they don't have that permission, then they will be uh, they won't be activated. If you have them all back, leave that off, and you you should be good to go. This function here is pretty useful when you, as the teacher, are pushing something out and you want to give some uh, instructions to model. You click on that button here and it will show your screen, okay? In this case, I have the wrong camera on. Um, that's okay, we'll just leave it. You should see your face though. Um, some of the functions here, you have filters that you can use. Um, to, you have text, the text, uh, so here we go, super. The nice thing is, is when you click outside the text, you can then manipulate where that text goes. So that's pretty neat. Um, you have stickers or emojis that you can choose from. The other thing that's pretty nice is you can make them bigger, make them smaller, um, and uh, and kind of just kind of play with them. It's pretty fun. Um, of course, you can do the drawing tool, pick your color, and draw shapes. This is really good for um, showing problems, math problems, scientific um, problems. Uh, what it's, it's a whiteboard. So basically, essentially a whiteboard, um, which is the next one. You can just create the whiteboard. And then the last one, you can just add an image. So it says add a custom sticker, but it's really, do you want to upload a photo? So maybe it is you're showing the path of Magellan and you upload a picture of the world and then you draw Magellan's path, which is pretty neat. Um, so once you're done, you can also upload uh, from your computer directly too. So once you're done, uh, or once you're ready, you've got your board set, you simply hit record, gives you a countdown, and you start talking. If students get stuck, they can pause the video, collect their thoughts, and then restart it. And then the recording will continue. As soon as you're done, they can either pause and hit next, or they can just hit next and we'll stop it. And you start talking. So then you can decide to, to use your video. You could always go back and add more to the video if they forgot something. Say they're all done. Oh, this, I didn't explain this. This is pretty um, important. Let me go back to add more. So there is a function in the student view. There's a button right here that will allow the students to see the prompt that the teacher gave them, which is really, really helpful if they're in this video piece. Um, they don't have to leave it and go back. There is a button, but I'm in the teacher record response, so it looks a little different. So we'll go to next. You can take a little selfie of yourself, click. And then it's really important 
um, that they hit this complete button once they're done and then that focus the uh, the video will be uploaded to this topic now the next thing I want to show you is um, this more options all right so topic tips are are uh, you know things to get like a sentence starters or warm-ups or, or something like that might help um, the topic attachments you can put in a Google Doc attachment here um, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and just leave that I am doing a more intuitive and in, in-depth class on this so we'll sit create topic all set now when you get to this your topic is all ready this is where you integrate with Google Classroom I'm gonna go ahead and pause and not do that but it is possible um, so this is a pretty basic overview of Flipgrid. I just showed you how to create a grid, how to create a topic. That's about it. The class on the 10th, I'll go into a little bit more detail on this and uh, if, if anybody's interested. So thanks for watching and have a great day. Hey everybody, I'm Jan Parker and I'm the EdTech coach for the Central Community here in APS. And this video is going to take you through a little bit about what the Chrome extension Kami is all about. We're not going to look at how to use Kami in this, just, a, just an overview of what it is and how you might be able to use it. Um, encourage you to come take a Kami 101 class uh, as soon as you can because uh, it's a pretty cool tool. I think you're going to really um, want to use it with your students regardless of the age group that you teach. So. With that plug, um, this is Kami. So this is this document that you're looking at here is a PDF that I created um, to teach the Kami 101 class. And it is open in Kami um, inside of a browser. So you can see my browser up here. So it's open up that way. And then over here on the left hand side are all of the different things that you can do with Kami. So Kami at its heart is an annotation and markup tool for PDFs. So it allows you and your students to highlight, strike through, inner text, um, draw shapes, whatever you need to do on a PDF, directly on the PDF. Um, so super handy for resources you have that are in PDF format um, that just don't convert well over to Google Docs, like it has images or maybe it's a Venn diagram something like that so it's super handy for that it has a lot of other uses too um, you can kind of hack the um, features of Kami and and turn it into almost anything you want so just a just a quick overview um, Kami has a dictionary so if you highlight a word <clears throat> with the dictionary tool selected it will show you the definition of that word it has text-to-speech capabilities so if you click this tool and say click here this pdf is designed to be a place to discover and play with the toolbar commands it so it will read the pdf to the user and you can adjust it with voices um, and speed and everything else um, markup of course is what it was built for uh, you can adjust colors too but if i wanted to mark up in pink then i could highlight with pink um, it has a box highlighter, which is handy for um, paragraphs, but it's also handy to box in an image, something like that. Of course, strike through and underline, self-explanatory. Um, it has commenting, just like you can comment in a Google Doc, you can use Kami to comment. So if I wanted to text comment on, say, this first instruction here, I could have text comment selected and then type my comment. Um, it has voice commenting, so if I wanted to do an audio voice comment, I could click here, and this starts recording my voice so that I can just speak my comment and students could hear it, or vice versa, students could speak their comment. And you can see that here. And this starts recording my voice. Right, I'm not going to put you through listening to that, but there you go. And then this one is pretty cool. It's video commenting, so it will record a video of your comment. Uh, it'll open up your webcam and record you talking about it. And then screen capture is one level above that. It will actually capture the screen as you're talking. So you could click here 
choose um, I'll choose application window and choose the one we're in right now with Cami and I'll click share and this is recording the actual PDF as I scroll through it and then I could grab the markup tool to explain something that I wanted to explain here and when I'm done I come back here and click done and it creates a screencast video of my voice as I scroll through the document. Um, so it's kind of like a built-in Screencastify um, directly into the Kami tools. If you ever do something and you want to get rid of it, you can just click the X. Um, text box, you can insert text. You can adjust the size. You can adjust the font. You can adjust everything. You get a toolbar editing up here. There's an equation editor. There's drawing tools, which admittedly are rudimentary and less than satisfying when you're trying to draw on a trackpad, but you can draw or asterisk. And you can also insert shapes, squares, circles, triangles. And then you can erase things, of course, as you make them. You can also insert images directly into a PDF. So this is kind of one of the ways that you can hack Kami. You could create a blank PDF, just a whiteboard, um, and then use it as a whiteboard. So it's just a white page of paper and then you could insert images into it directly in Kami, have kids draw on it, you draw on it. Um, so yeah, that's Kami. Um, tons of ways to use this with elementary students, middle school students, high school students. Obviously for deep reading, it's almost irreplaceable, uh, particularly when you're deep reading a PDF and students aren't holding the paper in front of them. Uh, but it's also handy for um, assistive tools like the text-to-speech for students. And I look forward to seeing you in Cami 101 so we can look at it further. So I'm just going to take a quick second and talk about Google Slides a little bit. Um, I see Google Slides as the Swiss army knife of G Suite apps. There's so much that you can do with slides. And, and often we just think of slides as like, you know, the PowerPoint of the Google world, but this is not your dad's PowerPoint. Google Slides can be so much more than just a presentation tool. So some of the things we look at in Slides 101, um, besides the usual inserting video and inserting images, things like that, um, recording your own voice, create your own adventure stories, check for understanding lessons, drag and drop slides. Of course, Pear Deck is built on Google Slides, so Pear Deck. And then even smash apping slides with Screencastify, which is kind of what you're looking at right now. This is a Google slideshow that I created. I'm in present mode and I am recording my screen making a video. So kind of smash apping the slides. Um, and then students can use all of those same tools. So students can create their own products. They can explain a concept. They can create an audio book where they record their voice reading their own stories. They can create choose your own adventure work of fiction. And of course, they can create presentations and everything else. Um, one of the things I want to show you to kind of get you excited about slides is drag and drop. So you can create drag and drop slides with um, Google, with Google Slides, sort of redundant there. Um, and I had three examples in the presentation. Um, one is for littles, right? So counting and then a couple for older kids. And so here's one of them. So here's counting apples. So I have this tree. I've got a number four over here. I've got some apples and I can then assign this to students via Google Classroom with the assignment that they need to drag four apples to the tree, right? And then they go to the next slide. Oh, it started at the bottom, but you get the picture. So um, notice the tree doesn't move, the grass doesn't move, the white box doesn't move. You can't accidentally grab anything. All you can grab are the apples. So we learn how to do that in Slides 101. Um, taking that to a slightly older group, I've got a Venn diagram here that I created. You can't move it. It's, it's in the background, but the words can be moved. Right, so you can drag the words over into the Venn diagram where they belong. And one other example, now I was a science teacher before I was an ed tech coach, so a lot of my examples are science. I apologize for my lack of imagination. Um, but here's one where um, all of this is background and students cannot move the stuff around and then they just follow these directions, um, inserting pictures, dragging them over, inserting text and labeling this timeline uh, life cycle of a star. So that's drag and drop. 
You can use the check for understanding ability, so the ability to hyperlink inside of a slide to other slides in the slideshow to create a choose your own adventure, but one for learning. I mean, choose your own adventure is learning in and of itself, right? The logical thinking of creating steps and cause and effect and what happens when you do that. So I'm not downplaying that at all, but you can also use it um, to create lessons for students to follow. And I'll show you a super simple example right here. This is one that I made for the Google Slides class. And so it's not, it's not much, it's just the question. So there's no content in this, but there could be, right? So here's a question. To insert video into a slide, you can. Two of these answers are correct, one of them is incorrect, right? If the student clicks on the incorrect answer, it takes them to this slide where I've inserted a video to review inserting video. So they watch that and they click here, I'm ready to answer again. They come back and they correct, click something that's correct and it moves them forward through the presentation. So then same thing would happen here. Images inserted into Google Slides cannot be cropped, only resized, that is false. And then that takes me to the very end of the slide and this is where I embed a link to a Google form and that's what students fill out because obviously teachers aren't going to know what students clicked on and as they went through this slideshow. They could click very fast, we know that, um, but you can embed a form here that is the formative assessment to see if they learned what you wanted them to learn, what the, if they met the objectives of the particular lesson. So then this just links to a Google form where they answer some questions, turn it in, and then the teacher has a sheet with um, every student that filled out the form. And so they know who went through the lesson. So that's one other way to use Google Slides. And then of course, we've kind of talked about the smash apping already. So um, I look forward to seeing you in Slides 101. I think you will learn a few new things, um, even if you feel like you're a Slides expert. So I hope you guys are having a great day. Hi, this is Greg. I wanted to talk a little bit about a cool Google Chrome extension that we are using in our district called Screencastify. Screencastify allows you to record whatever activity you are performing on your computer, whatever's happening on the screen, while narrating over it. It's this extension icon up here. It's next to your Omnibar. Uh, it may not be the same order as mine, of course, but every Buddy that works for Aurora Public Schools, if you have an aurorak12.org email address, in other words, you will have this icon automatically installed by our IT department. If you do not see it, you want to check your profile and make sure that sync is turned on or make sure that you are logged into Chrome as a aurorak12.org user. So using Screencastify is as simple as clicking on the extension icon. You can see that as a district, we have purchased Screencastify Unlimited. I'll go over those properties in a little bit, the, the advantages of that. You can record your desktop, just a browser tab, or your webcam if you are just wanting to make a personal connection. Uh, my microphone is turned on, so I am narrating over my uh, recording when I start recording. I chose not to embed my webcam for this. Uh, you can change the countdown, you can show the annotation tools and other editing tools, and you can also uh, record the system audio. If I click the big blue button and then select the screen that I want to record, usually selecting the entire screen is a good default. And so now I'm recording my screen. You can see the Screencastify icon now has changed so it has a red dot. That means that it's actively recording. If I click on that icon, I have the options of just deleting this. I can start over, I can pause, or I can stop the recording and say I'm finished and I want to review it. That's what I'm gonna do. And so my video is automatically playing back from where it is saved in my Google Drive. The nice thing about Screencastify is all your videos are saved on your Google Drive in a Screencastify folder that is automatically created for you. You don't have to worry about saving these videos. You have the options of trimming your video. So for example, if I did not like the beginning, I can move the scissors and cut off, say, the first four seconds. I can cut off 
about the same amount at the end if I don't like that part and save the trim if I like or cancel. The nice thing about having our unlimited version is that we have access to our editor. You also have the option of recording as long as you want without limitations. Usually that's not a best practice. You can also share your video either to Google Classroom, publishing it to YouTube. You can upload it to Edpuzzle for a lesson there. If I do open this in my editor, then I have more options of either adding and merging videos that I've already created. I can add text boxes to overlay. I can crop my video. I can also trim my video, just like when I was in the other screen. I can also export the finished version to a new file on my Google Drive or download as an MP4 file. And so that's the basics of Screencastify. It's very easy to use. The best way to learn it is just to start and play with it. You can't break anything. You can be really creative. Another thing you might want to consider is getting certified. The Screencastify website offers a couple of badges for adults. The Master of the Screencast is the first one. It's just an hour of videos that you would engage in. It's mostly how you use Screencastify in your classroom, not all, all the technical aspects. And if you wanted to move on to more Google app integrations, you can try for the Genius Badge. Usually you'll have a quiz at the end and upload a screencast of your own making. And of course, there are plenty of examples of how to use Screencastify. There are a couple of eBooks that Screencastify has produced by celebrity ed tech bloggers. And so you can get ideas of how to use it both in the classroom or outside the classroom. For example, if you wanted to use it for parent communication and that sort of thing. So I hope you uh, enjoyed the video and have fun playing with Screencastify.